I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm very honoured to give this inaugural lecture in the, in the William Connolly Summer School. The Summer School is a great idea and I'm very pleased that in spite of all the problems we have today here and around the world with this pandemic, uh, the Summer School is carrying on. I think that's very worthwhile. The title of my book, Irish History Matters, can be viewed in two ways. It can, the word matters is the key point here. It can be used as a noun or a verb. In my book, I look at Irish history matters. Now, what I mean by that is uh, subjects such as uh, identities, commemoration and politics. That's when I use it as a noun. But I also use it as a verb. Irish history matters. What I mean is Irish history is important. Uh, a major concern of my book is how and why history is important in Ireland. Over the years, I've tracked how ideas of history have impacted on current politics in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I've looked at the way historical myths, uh, historical perceptions, ideas of the past have influenced the present in Ireland. Uh, various observers have commented on how uh, much people refer to the past in Ireland. The South African leader Michael Cassidy visited Ireland in 1996 and he remarked this, one notices how people are gripped by the past, remembering the past, feeding on the past. He concluded, these realities of the past feed into the present in Ireland more than anywhere I have been. The historian A.T.Q. Stewart has remarked, to the Irish, all history is applied history, and the past is simply a convenient quarry which provides ammunition to use against enemies in the present. End of quote. In my opinion, these views served in part to cause and sustain the troubles which ran for three decades from the late 1960s until the late 1990s. Of course, what lay at the root of the conflict was not history, but modern day problems, particularly over nationality and to a lesser extent over religion. At the same time, ideas of ancient enmities served to significantly influence how people understood and expressed these matters. They've had a number of effects. They've encouraged mistrust between people, uh, they've caused fatalism. People feel well, they've, things have always been like this, so things will never improve. They also served to legitimize the use of violence. J. Boyer Bell wrote that in other countries, people are, were emboldened to act by Lenin or Mao's example, by Allah's word or the people's need. In Ireland, however, he said, people were killed to quote history's tune and the blare of those unseen trumpets, audible always to the faithful. In Ireland, legitimacy was won from history, end of quote. Eventually, many of these historical perceptions were challenged, which, allowed to, which helped to allow important reconciliation and to, meet, and to promote the peace process. New ideas of revised history and shared history aided these changes. This new approach was taken by both members of the public and our political leaders. On the 14th of May 2000, President Mary McAleese spoke of how in Ireland, quote, we have so often raided the past for proof of our differences, end of quote. She urged that as we try to create a new future together, and I quote again, might we not look at our histories and find in shared memories source of unity rather than division." End of quote. In 2007, uh, Taoiseach Bertie Ahern and First Minister Ian Paisley held several key meetings, including one at the site of the Battle of the Boyne. On this occasion, Ian Paisley declared, I welcome that at last we can embrace this battle site as part of our shared history End of quote. 
A four-day visit of Queen Elizabeth uh, in 2011 contained frequent reference to history, uh, but in a way that included regret for past conflict, and an acknowledgement of each other's traditions, an appreciation for shared history, and a determination to move together to the future. Her visit to Dublin uh, had a, a tremendous impact. Commemoration of the 1916 Dublin Rising showed how new ideas of history influenced this event. This is an important event uh, for the founding of, of the Irish state. However, there was little of the triumphalism shown in 1966. A more considered approach was taken. At Glasnevin Cemetery, a memorial wall was erected to all those who died during the Rising, including 41 Irishmen serving in the British Army. So that's one area, uh, the impact of the past, uh, how it has influenced things and new views we've taken on the past. Uh, Irish identity is another concern in, in my book. I look at a section, I, I have a section called identities rather than just identity because a principal point I want to bring out is the great varieties of Irish identity. Irish identity can be understood and expressed in many ways. As an historian, I've been interested to study these various forms of Irish identity. I have a personal interest in the subject. My father was a Church of Ireland rector, born in Belfast, uh, educated at Trinity College Dublin, who served his ministry, uh, mostly in County Down. He was also a former army chaplain, a veteran of D-Day, who landed on Gold Beach on the 6th of June, 1944. He considered himself to be a loyal British subject stroke citizen. He was also a proud Irishman. In the early 20th century, most Unionists in Ireland, North and South, viewed themselves as Irish. They were Irish, loyal to the British Crown and subjects of the United Kingdom. Elements of an Ulster consciousness can be observed in these years, but this did not exclude an Irish dimension. In 1912 at Westminster, the MP T.P. O'Connor challenged Ronald McNeil, later Lord Cushendon, a, a, a Unionist MP, on this point. He said, I observe the honourable gentleman calls himself an Ulsterman. Does he mean by that he's an Ulsterman and not an Irishman? End of quote. McNeil replied, I use the expression Ulsterman as a more particular phrase. Of course I regard myself as being an Irishman. End of quote. From 1912 onwards, with the deepening crisis of the future of Ireland and the rise of a new organised resistance in Ulster to Home Rule, attitudes to identity began to change. For many, Unionists, Ulster became more important in Ireland. Of course, at the beginning of the last century, Irish nationalists had also a very strong sense of Irish identity, but a different sense of Irish identity. As Gerard O'Toole has pointed out, the Irish parliamentary leaders were comfortable with an Irish identity which sought a parliament in Dublin and involved a sense of patriotism, which accepted Ireland's place in the larger family of the British Empire. Robert Lind, a Belfast-born Presbyterian and a member of the Gaelic League in Sinn Féin, in a book in 1909, asked, what is an Irishman? He said that the real Irishman was simply someone born in Ireland. And this included the Irish labourer of the North, as well as the Catholic labourer or Celt of the South. At the same time, there were people such as D.P. Moran, who emphasised links between Catholicism and Irish nationality. Faith and fatherland was an important motto for those who believed only Catholics could be truly uh, Irish. Following the 1916 rising of the War of Independence, there was a shift in political identity among Irish nationalists from acceptance of home rule to demands for a republican form of government with no links to Britain. Post 1921, then what happens? 
Well, post-1921 in the new Northern Ireland, we can witness the development of a heightened sense of British identity, embracing Ulster or Northern Ireland, linked primarily to the Protestant community, which denied increasingly any sense of Irishness. At the same time, the Irish Free State experienced the growth of its own heightened form of Irish Gaelic identity, linked primarily to the Catholic community. In his 1935 St. Patrick's Day speech, Eamon de Valera declared that Ireland had been a Catholic and Christian nation since St. Patrick. She remains a Catholic nation, he said. Nonetheless, we should note that in 1937, Douglas Hyde, a member of the Church of Ireland, was elected as the first Irish president. The movement in the Northern Unionist community away from an Irish identity, however, did not take place overnight. And in fact, many Irish, many Ulster Unionists retained an Irish dimension to their identity. When Lord Craig Avon died in 1940, John M. Andrews' successor paid tribute to him as, quote, a great Ulsterman, a great Irishman, and a great imperialist. In 1968, just before the outbreak of the Troubles, Professor Richard Rose conducted a survey in Northern Ireland about national identity. Of the Protestants polled, nearly all of whom we can assume were Unionists and carried British passports, 20% viewed themselves as Irish. Uh, the others then uh, viewed themselves as Ulster or British, but 20% in 1968 were happy to call themselves Irish. Now, Brian Faulkner, the MP and later uh, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, is interesting in this matter uh, of Irish identity. In 1959, it was suggested to the Northern Ireland Cabinet that the name of Ireland in the state should be dropped. Uh, I think there's a preference for calling the, the, the country Ulster. But the idea was rejected due to Faulkner's objections. He stated that he was not prepared to concede to the South a monopoly of the term Irish. He saw nothing incompatible with being Northern Irish and British. In 1971, Faulkner wrote that in the same way as Scots can be British and Scottish, quote, the Northern Ireland citizen is Irish and British. It is a matter of compliment, not of conflict. The Rose survey also revealed that among Catholics, uh, the vast majority saw themselves as Irish, but some 20% viewed themselves as British or Ulster, uh, which is quite interesting. Subsequent decades, due to the Troubles, the impact of the Troubles, saw important changes in identity. By 1989, just 3% of Protestants identified as Irish. Uh, compared to 14% for Ulster and 68% for British. So that's a, a decline. It was also a decline then on the Catholic side. Catholic choosing a British identity had fallen to 8%. But this survey also revealed uh, a, a new identity that some 16% of Protestants and 25% of Catholics opted for a Northern Irish identity. Uh, and I'll perhaps refer to that a little later. What about identity in the Republic at this time? Roddy Doyle, the writer, has recalled about Ireland in the 1980s. It was the insistence that if you're Irish, you're white and you're Catholic as well. And if you're not both of those things, then you're not fully Irish. End of quote. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement marked an important development in acknowledging the possibility of diversity of identity. It recognised the right of all the people of Ireland, quote, to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose. Now, the interesting word there is both. They're saying it is possible to be both British and Irish. Uh, this is a very important point. Uh, at this time in early 1998, uh, when these talks were going on, there was a lot of talk about the two uh, identities were British and Irish. Um, I wrote an article in the Belfast Telegraph saying it wasn't as simple as that and that it was perfectly possible to be British and Irish. Uh, I don't know whether that had any influence, uh, but certainly it's important that in the Good Friday Agreement, it does say we can be British or Irish or both. 
Some unionists then became more relaxed about accepting an Irish dimension. At his first talks with Bertie O'Hearn in Dublin in April 2007, Ian Paisley remarked, I'm proud to be an Ulsterman, but I'm also proud of my Irish roots. And then on the 30th of May 2008 on UTV, he described himself as an Irish unionist. In the Republic, in recent decades, we've seen the emergence of a more pluralist sense of Irish identity. In Rome in June, 19, in Rome in June 2011, President Mary McAleese said, despite past religious and political conflicts, modern Ireland has emerged as a country, a family, which is once Catholic, Protestant, agnostic, atheist, Islamic, Jewish. End of quote. At Breaky Orange Hall, Ballyborough, B- Ballyborough, County Cavan in 2008, she declared that the following says of the 1998 agreement, quote, it is possible to be both Irish and British, possible to be orange and Irish. End of quote. Nonetheless, surveys in Northern Ireland in the last two decades have shown still a low number of Protestants who identify as Irish, only some 4% in 2011 census, although there's a slightly higher figure identify as Northern Irish and Irish. Now, this low number may be because Irishness and Britishness are still viewed by many as exclusive and diametrically opposed to each other. At the same time, two developments should be noticed. A significant number of both religious communities identify as Northern Irish. The 2011 census recorded that 21% identified as Northern Irish. Of these, 58% were from a Catholic background, while 38% were from a Protestant background. I believe that Northern Irishness can be seen as a form of Irish identity, and that is quite a significant development. The second point, the second development, relates to devolution in the UK. I think this is an important implication for identity in Northern Ireland. Uh, Devolution in the UK has led to a new appreciation that the United Kingdom is a multinational state uh, made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The census reported an increase in national consciousness and noticed that national identity in the UK is now multidimensional. So many people in Great Britain now identify not first of all as British, but first of all as English or Scottish. Of course, they remain British citizens, uh, but this national identity uh, is now being expressed in a new way in Britain. Recently, Prime Ministers May and Johnson have talked of the four nations that make up the modern British state. To what nation does Northern Ireland belong? For unionists, the answer can be the Irish nation. Unionists can perfectly legitimately see themselves as part of the Irish nation, that part which values the link with Britain and British citizenship. For many, their identity is already multidimensional. In the future, given developments in Britain, it may be possible for unionists to acknowledge an Irish identity without feeling they're compromising their Britishness. This debate on identity will continue Brexit and constitution developments in Britain may influence matters. Let me mention two other aspects of the uh, Irish identity which I look at this book, which I think are relevant. They concern the Irish diaspora. Recent research on the Irish diaspora, that's the people who've left Ireland and their descendants, have revealed some very interesting information on them and their ideas of identity. As regards America, People were very surprised when in 1980, it turned out that nearly 40 million people in the US uh, declared that their ancestry was Irish, claimed an Irish ancestry. There was even greater surprise when it was revealed that over half had a Protestant background. There are various reasons for this, but the main one is that many of these people are the descendants of 18th century emigrants from Ulster, the first major wave 
of immigrants from Ireland to America. It's reckoned that about a quarter of a million of these people, predominantly from Ulster, predominantly Presbyterian, leave in the 18th century up to, and then in the early 19th century up to say 1820. So they were there before anybody else and their numbers have multiplied and for a mathematical reason there are so many of them. So that explains, that's a major reason. There are other reasons for their large numbers, but that's a major reason. And the interesting thing about these people is that while a significant number describe their ancestry as Scots-Irish or Scotch-Irish, the majority call their ancestry Irish. They describe their ancestry as Irish. These findings reveal to people in Ireland another variety of Irish identity, which is contrary to the simplistic views that Irish equates with Catholic, or that Protestants can't be Irish. Uh, these 20 million in America are quite happy to say they are, and they have this background. The Irish diaspora in Great Britain provides another contrasting variant on Irish identity abroad. It is reckoned that some 10 to 12 million people in Britain have Irish ancestors due to major immigration in the 19th and 20th century. Many of these people play a prominent part in British life. You will recall that when Tony Blair, Prime Minister Tony Blair, came to the Doyle in 1998, uh, he talked about how his mother was born above a shop in Ballyshannon, County Donegal. Many other leading politicians have an Irish background. This Irish prominence in the public eye extends into broadcasting and sport. One thinks of Terry Wogan in the past and Graham Norton today. Then there's the captain of the English football team, Harry Kane, and the recent captain of Manchester United, Harry Maguire, uh, both from Irish backgrounds. At the same time, we can note that most are very well integrated into British society. In spite of the many millions with Irish ancestry, a relatively lo low number declare an Irish ethnic background in the census returns, only some three quarters of a million. Ideas of Britishness or Scottishness or Englishness have been able to accommodate these people with Irish roots. Um, so therefore we should not see Britishness and Irishness as incompatible or intrinsically opposed. Here there's been a, a, a certain blending. Finally, I want to mention commemorations, especially of those Irish who served in the two world wars. Uh, this is very appropriate to discuss in this context of history and how we understand it, because on these matters there's been great changes in how we understand uh, these events. This has not only uh, meant that we view things differently, but it's had a very important reconciliatory aspect to it. Immediately after the end of the Great War, on Armistice Day, there were widespread events in Ireland, north and south, to remember those who died. It is reckoned that some 40,000 people from Ireland were killed, a majority from what became the Irish Free State. Subsequently, however, thanks to political events, this became a contested occasion. Members of the new Irish Free State government did give some recognition to the event Armistice Day uh, when these events are remembered. But in the 1930s, any official government participation on the day ceased. The Irish National War Memorial Park opened in 1937, but without government involvement. In Northern Ireland, Armistice Day and then Remembrance Sunday remained an important occasion, especially for members of the Unionist community. In the South, uh, parades continued on that day, but numbers became smaller. In 1966, there was a suggestion that a bridge, part of the original plan, uh, for the National War Memorial should be built between the War Memorial and Phoenix Park. This was rejected by Taoiseach Sean Lamas on the grounds that, quote, it was too late to do anything in recognition of the British soldiers' part of the historical tradition of the Irish nation, end of quote. From the outbreak of the Troubles, commemoration of the war became, of, of the two wars, became very restricted in the southern 26 counties. By 1979, the National War Memorial at Island Bridge had become, as Kevin Myers later recalls, a vandalised tip head. In, the Northern, in Northern Ireland, parades still occurred in Remembrance Sunday, 
but the events were mainly attended by members of the unionist community. From the late 1980s, however, the nature of these war commemorations changed markedly north and south. An important factor was the reaction to the 11 deaths caused by an IRA bombing in a Skillen, County Fermanagh on Remembrance Sunday in 1987. There was immediate widespread con condemnation in the south of this bombing. As historian Jane Leonard has pointed out, public revulsion over the matter fueled, and I quote, a recent desire in the Republic of Ireland to remember the Irish who served in both world wars. As a result of this change of opinion, over the following years, a number of war memorials were restored and public parades and commemorative events were held once again on Remembrance Sunday. People once again uh, started to explore this part of their history. The Irish government agreed to fund the restoration of the National War Memorial, which was opened officially in 1994 by Bertie Ahern. For the first time in 1993, the Irish President, Mary Robinson, attended the Remembrance Sunday service in Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. There were also changes in Northern Ireland. Dr Ian Adamson, a unionist councillor, formed the, U the Somme Association. This led to the establishment of the Somme Museum in Newton Ards, where we are today. Very deliberately, and this was intentional on the part of Ian Adamson and those who formed it, the centre seemed to remember those from all over Ireland, not just the men of the 36th Ultra Division who died at the Somme. Since the Belfast uh, Good Friday Agreement, efforts to commemorate the Irish who served and died in the two world wars, especially the first, has grown. This has been an important age for reconciliation. In November 1998, a major ceremony to dedicate the Messine Peace Tower was attended by Belgian, Irish and British heads of state and many public members. This uh, uh, tower, this peace park had been established by uh, uh, Glenn Barr uh, from Derry and Paddy Hart from Donegal. Together they raised money and raised volunteers to establish this park in memory of all those from Ireland who died in the war. And as they made quite clear, this wasn't just about remembering the past, but it was looking to the future, uh, and that was very deliberate. After this event, the Belfast Newsletter commented that the event marked a further throwing in the unofficial Cold War that existed between the two countries for most of this century. All of such events illustrate the significance of commemoration, war commemoration, for reconciliation. In 2007, at Galway Cathedral. A service was held to remember County Galway servicemen killed in the First World War. Until recently, such a ceremony would have been unlikely. After this occasion, a photograph in the press showed two leading politicians from north and south and from very different backgrounds standing together. One was Eamon O'Keeve and the other was Sir John Gorman. Now, who are these two people? Well, Eamon O'Keefe was a Fianna Fáil member of Doyle Éireann and an Irish government minister. He was also the grandson of New York-born Eamon de Valera, who, in the name of the Irish Republic, commanded the Irish volunteer garrison at Bowlands Mills <clears throat> during the 1916 Rising and later became Irish Taoiseach and President. Well, who was Sir, who was Sir John Gorman? Sir John Gorman, uh, was the holder of a military cross for bravery on D-Day. He's a former British army officer, an RUC inspector, and Ulster Unionist Party member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. But he was also the son of Royal Irish Constabulary Officer Jack Gorman, County Tipperary born and last adjutant of the RIC depot in Phoenix Park, Dublin. After the depot was formally vacated by the police in May 1922, he drove north for loyalty to the Crown and joined the RUC. They're present together here at this event, these two people whose ancestors had been enemies, 
Their presence together <clears throat> at this event showed the reconciliatory impact of these war commemorations. In 2007, the first official meeting of the Irish President, Mary, Robins, Mary McAleese, and Northern Ireland's First Minister, Ian Paisley, took place here in the Somme Museum to open an exhibition on the 36th Ulster Division and the 16th Irish Division. On that occasion, Ian Paisley said, Mary McAleese and myself have come here to pay tribute to all those who fought and died for us. There may have been division then, but not now. End of quote. Uh, centenary, then the Great War Centenary, uh, we've been celebrating, we've been, no, we've been, we've been celebrating is the wrong word, but we've been marking uh, the Great War from 1914 to 1918, and there have been events then 100 years later to mark these occasions. Um, these, I believe, have been very important, uh, both from our historical point of view and the idea of reconciliation. On Remembrance Sunday, the 11th of November, 2018, I was present at ceremonies in Enniskillen to mark the 100th anniversary of the Armistice. On the original Armistice Day in 1918, Enniskillen was the first place in Ireland or Britain on the morning of the 11th uh, of November when Armistice was declared to ring bells to celebrate the end of the war. What had happened was a vigilant <clears throat> telephonist, a wireless operator in the army barracks, a 645 picked up a message sent by Marshal Foch to all his commanders at the front saying at 11 o'clock today, the war will end. So he got his commanding officer out of his bed. They then got the rector out of his bed and the bells rang in Enniskillen uh, before they rang in London. They only rang in London about an hour later. Uh, so uh, Armistice Day was a special occasion. But on this occasion, uh, it was a very special day. Present was Arlene Foster, former First Minister of Northern Ireland, and Heather Humphreys, Irish Government Minister. They were among those who laid wreaths at the Cenotaph. In the parade from the Cenotaph to the service in the cathedral, there were not only members of the Royal British Legion, but also a large contingent of veterans of the Irish Army wearing their blue United Nations berries. This event reminded us once again of our history. It also reflected a widespread desire for reconciliation and coexistence. Thank you very much. <laughs>